So hello, students of ancient history. Last time we just kind of delved into classical Greece and the, the sharing, the cross-pollination between the ancient world of uh, the Orient and, um, and Greece and looked at some of the real har hallmarks of developing Greek culture. And uh, I just touched on um, the, uh, the Theogony written by the poet Hesiod. And from that come down to us all the great myths. So this is really one of my favorite lectures. This is one of really my favorite aspects of Greek culture is uh, their classical myth. I just, uh, the kid in me comes out and I just want to sit and listen to all these great old stories. So, um, and I used to really love to do that, just to sit and listen to these things. Um, but they, along with just being really interesting stories, they are. They also communicate very profound truths within Greek culture because the Greeks didn't have psychology. Um, they didn't understand um, how the human psyche uh, works. They couldn't articulate it in a way that we can. They, but they could very well uh, explain human psychology. They just could not do the science of it, and they do this through myth. They, drew, they, uh, they use it to understand um, the, the, the questions of uh, morality. They do it to understand um, the questions of how to behave, how to be virtuous, and ultimately, why do we suffer and, and things like that. And they, they do it to explain their world that they live in because they don't have uh, the kind of scientific power and reasoning that we uh, that we have in our modern world, at least that they did not understand the world in the same way that we do. So we will begin today by looking at classical mythology. And as I have referenced many times, Joseph Campbell um, has written extensively about myth and uh, the meaning within myth, and um, my respect for him knows no bounds. And so when we look at mythology, just the word mythology, and I know I've, I've said this in a previous lecture, but it simply means to pass down reason, which is logos, uh, by mouth. So to speak reason is what mythology literally means. Mythos, to pass down by mouth, to speak, and reason, the logos. So there are many different kinds of, of myth, and uh, um, we will look at the, several of these today, and I've left some of these here, but uh, um, I really think the etiological myth, that the explaining of reality or society, why something is the way that it is, is very powerful, um, is the most powerful kind of myth within Greek, uh, Greek culture. So let's get straight to it. So who were the gods? Well, unlike Christianity or Islam or Judaism, the Greeks, like most of the people in the ancient world were polytheists, meaning that they had many gods and goddesses. And that the there are multiple generations of gods and goddesses, meaning um, that how you explain the origins of the world comes through multiple generations of deities. That originally there was chaos and uh, there the the sky, the earth, the water took on uh, elements of uh, of human of human um, understanding, and that procreation happened between sky and earth, and therefore the titans came about, and then from the titans came the gods that we know as the true Olympian deities, those 12 great figures that lived up on Mount Olympus and ruled over the Greek world, the, the Zeus being the king of the gods. And we will get to go through a few of their stories today, and um, we will recount many of the things that are within the Theogony. As I said, we have the elements, the animistic elements of sky and water and earth and land through Uranus, sky, and Gaia, earth, which bring us the titans. And Kronos was being the greatest of the titans, and he overthrew his father, Uranus, and became the, uh, the ruler of the world, only to uh, be married to his sister, Rhea. And he then 
devoured his own children that they had together in, because he feared being overthrown so much as he himself had overthrown. And wouldn't you know it, um, he is tricked by his wife and he uh, is given a stone instead of baby Zeus and baby Zeus ends up um, growing up and overthrowing his father. So Zeus becomes the king of the Olympian gods and he is the greatest and po most powerful of the gods and he ha uses the uh, the weapon of the thunderbolt. That, that is a symbol of Zeus and there's the great temple to Zeus um, in uh, in Olympia. Oh, and I should say something. One of the uh, the children of uh, of Zeus is actually uh, Athena, which is the goddess of wisdom, who springs out fully grown out of um, his head because there was an oracle that Zeus would be defeated by the child of one of the. Uh, of the of the graces which is a, of Thetis and so therefore Zeus cuts open his own leg and he puts her in there and uh, sure enough after a while uh, with the help of Hephaestus his son uh, he has this terrible headache and uh, Hephaestus takes his uh, takes his axe there and, and uh, hits Zeus on the head pops open and out uh, out comes uh, Athena, fully formed, who is the goddess of wisdom. So, from enormous, or I think uh, the, the 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 deeper myth within this is that Zeus, representing absolute power, um, you must have great wisdom come out of absolute power. To have great power requires great wisdom. In order to wield great power, it means that you need to have great wisdom. And also, his daughter Athena, she wears a key around his neck, or around her neck. And that is the key to the chamber where Zeus keeps his thunderbolts. So, through wisdom comes great power. So, the ultimate weapon in the universe to the Greeks was the thunderbolt, and through wisdom you get this great power. So, Zeus can't get his thunderbolts without her help. So the creation of human beings always coming down. This is Prometheus here, a famous painting. And Prometheus created humankind. He formed them out of the clay, and he gave them life, and he gave them fire. And Zeus feared humankind, and so Zeus took away the fire, and Prometheus gave it back. Prometheus was a titan. And he taught them how to, he taught them knowledge and wisdom and how to, how to build things. And therefore, Zeus imprisoned him because Prometheus defied Zeus. And every day, Prometheus has to suffer by having his liver eaten out. And of course, it regenerates because he's an immortal god and cannot die. Um, it regenerates, but he must endure this suffering every day from his, his prison where he's chained on a mountain. And um, this goes to show the suffering figure that a god sacrificed his own... Uh, free will that he sacrifices his own happiness in order uh, for humankind to live and this is a theme that we see in, in uh, several religions including Christianity so Zeus to get back at man I say I, uh, Prometheus only created males and Zeus to get back at males creates Pandora which is the first woman and he sends them, sends her down, and of course all the males are very uh, enamored by her. And then Zeus says, now, I'm going to give you this box to take down there to, uh, to Earth. And don't open it, whatever you do. And he puts in there all the bad things uh, in the world, uh, disease, plague, famine, um, and sure enough, Pandora gets pretty curious, and one night she pops open the box, and everything comes out into the world. So the Greeks here, it's an interesting and a fun story, um, but they're explaining why do we suffer? Why, why is there suffering? Why is there cancer in the world? You know, why, why, do we, uh, why do we have crop failures and people starve? You know, they're trying to explain here um, why there is evil in the world and why does humankind suffer? 
So the Greeks believed that there were these kind of spiritual deities, demigod figures, uh, the fates, the graces, and the muses, and they inspired and ruled over human society. That uh, they, they, uh, the, the graces, for instance, gave you um, the gifts of, of behaving well, having sophistication and style. The muses inspire you to do great things, to play the piano, or to uh, write really good history. And if you're wondering, the muse Cleo is the muse of history. Yes, history has its own muse. Um, so if you are feeling inspired to do something, perhaps one of the muses invisible to you is singing in your ear. And of course, the fates, usually depicted as three older women, um, ruled over um, all things, that they decided the fate of all human beings. And the queen of the gods, Hera, um, she was... Um, renowned for kind of her jealousy and anger against Zeus, and Zeus is very renowned um, for his, his uh, promiscuity. And Zeus would frequently go to uh, mortal women in, in the guise of various animals, uh, such as uh, Leda and the swan. Here Zeus, of course, is this, uh, is this swan, and he would, uh, you know, he would uh, produce these, he would uh, have sex with them, swoon them, and he would, um, um, they would, would produce these great heroes, such as, as Hercules. And uh, one particular poor young lady, uh, Io, was having an affair with Zeus, or Zeus was trying to get her to have an affair with him. And uh, they're sitting around, and suddenly he hears Hera coming out of the clouds, and he says, hang on, Io, uh, I'm going to turn you into a cow. And so, poof, Io is turned into a cow. And Hera comes down and says, Hey, sweetheart, what are you doing? And he says, Oh, nothing, you know, just sitting here. And she, she, uh, she says, Oh, well, what's this cow doing here, just randomly standing here? And he says, Oh, nothing, it's just some just average, ordinary cow, nothing, nothing to see here. And she says, Well, can I have it? Well, I mean, yeah, why do you need it? She says, Well, I just really want it. Can I have it? Yes, you can have it. And... So poor Io then is chased all over the world um, with this by a gadfly that Hera sends after her because Hera can see through this, um, and uh, uh, so this is the, the story of suffering um, through uh, infidelity. But it's a, it's a, Zeus's affairs were very very numerous, and. The Greeks also had gods of, of uh, all the elements. That Hades was the god of the underworld, and you can, he's pictured here with his three-headed dog that guards the gates to the underworld, which was a literal place underneath the world um, where all people went. They didn't really have a conception of, of uh, a heaven and a hell. Um, there was Elysia and Tartarus, um, but you have to do something just exceptionally good or exceptionally bad to end up in either of these places. Um, most people just ended up in Hades, and it was not... Uh, the concept of death was something you just really didn't want uh, in any fashion to do. That it was always better to be alive. The the uh, the great hero Achilles doesn't even get to go to Elysia, um, and he says it would be better to be the lowliest shepherd and be alive than to be the king over the dead. So we've talked about Apollo and his sister Artemis, and the gods uh, conceptualize um, the emotions as being part or the, the Greeks conceptualized emotion as being very um, important, and that the bloodlust and, and anger that you get in war is related in some ways to sort of this romantic, fiery passion. So they, ha they um, allowed the, the uh, or they wrote in that the, the god of war, Ares, uh, was married or had uh, affairs with um, regularly um, the goddess of love, Aphrodite, and you can see... Um, sort of this this um, this blending of sort of these raw emotions of passion and anger and how these things uh, come together. This is, these are the Greeks doing psychology. And also another form of myth is explaining why things are the way they are, right? An etiological myth explains reality. Why do we have four seasons, you would ask? Well, it is because the god Hades saw a beautiful goddess Persephone 
wandering in the fields, and he uh, ascended, and he stole her away and married her down in the underworld. And her mother happened to be Demeter, who was the goddess of the harvest and fertility of the land. And so, therefore, um, there's a big ordeal over this uh, Hades stealing away Persephone. And anyway, Zeus finally has to get involved. And it's a, a deal is, is made that Persephone will go and live in the underworld for four months with her husband Hades. And that the rest of the time or excuse me, six months she will go and live with Hades, and six months she will live with her mother on Earth. So in the wintertime, when things are really bad and cold and nasty, um, Persephone is in the underworld with uh, her husband, and therefore the goddess of uh, fertility and agriculture and the harvest withdraws her blessing from the land, and everything goes barren in this winter. And as uh, she's preparing for her daughter to come back, she's getting excited and she's happy. Therefore, springtime comes about. Then when Persephone is with her mother, it's uh, happy and it's, uh, things are being harvested. And then, of course, she's uh, looking. Uh, she gets sad and is, is uh, concerned about her daughter having to leave her again. So therefore, you have the season of fall equal four seasons. Therefore, the Greeks are explaining a reality through a very clever story. And one of my favorite god here is, is uh, Dionysius, uh, the uh, the wine of or the god of uh, of good times, and uh, wine. And he is uh, um, the personification of sort of this this uh, madness that comes over someone. That if when you drink too much, um, you change into something else. And and Dionysius is this very um, transformative god that he's. Uh, violently passionate one time and, and not another. So he's, it's, uh, again, Dionysius is, and his followers were uh, uh, part of this this uh, this trying attempt to understand the madness that comes over you at times, and uh, when you are when you are out of your mind, how do you deal with insanity? There again, there are many mortal heroes such as uh, Perseus who defeats the great Gorgon Medusa, cuts off her head. It's a very, it's a very clever story. I just don't have time to tell all these. Um, every great culture um, has a strong man legend, basically. Uh, Samson in, in the Jewish uh, uh, religion, you have uh, Gilgamesh in uh, the ancient Near East, and you have Hercules or Heracles um, in, uh, in the, the Greek legends. And he does these great labors because um, he is this this powerful, uh, great greatest of all men. He's half god, son of Zeus, um, and he's forced to do all these labors because he occasionally gets mad and kills people he shouldn't, and occasionally his family. And this is his punishment. All of these twelve labors that are virtually impossible to do. Well, Hercules does them all, um, and uh, but he constantly finds himself getting into trouble. And almost always it's on account of a woman um, and, and womanly uh, guile and wisdom that it brings down the strong man. You know, Samson is destroyed by Delilah and, uh, and Hercules is destroyed by his own lover because of her jealousy. So it's uh, uh, usually it shows that even the greatest man, right? I think, I think there's some deep psycholo psychology here um, that uh, even the greatest man can be brought down by a woman. And while you're thinking maybe all the Greeks thought these legends were true, and they, they uh, and many did accept the theogony, the writing, the great writing of Hesiod. But there were some people who said this is all bunk, the gods do not exist whatsoever, and we often call these people the pre-Socratic philosophers. So uh, anybody who came before Socrates is a pre-Socratic philosopher, but I, I think the name Ionian rationalists is, is, uh, more, is better descriptive. And they come from the Isle of Ionia, Iona, which is near uh, present-day Turkey, or Anatolia in the ancient world, um, and they rejected completely as I say, the gods and the theogony and everything that comes out of this. And uh, they sought rather to understand the world through rationality, that 
mankind can explore, can understand um, why the world works the way it does through science. Um, and therefore, they, they didn't totally reject any kind of divine uh, elements within the world, as did some of the Enlightenment thinkers, really the radical Enlightenment thinkers. Um, but rather, they, they sought to explain things more thoroughly, that they believed that there was a, a divine spark or a presence of some kind of a creation. Um, but after that creation, um, there are much better ways that uh, you can explain the world. So here we have some kind of pre-enlightenment thinking um, as far back as uh, of the uh, 7th century BC. So those people do exist. So this is all for today, and I hope you have got your, uh, got your fill here of, of classical myth and uh, some of the things that are coming out of, of the ancient world and why the Greeks did classical myth and how it was such a, a vital component of their own psychology and understanding of the world. So uh, until next time, stay healthy, wealthy, and wise.